My interest in geology and deep time has led me to work with processes which run on time scales which are very different from the way we humans experience time uh, in our everyday life. And actually it's really interesting what was talked before and, and, and also was presented before I think uh, resonates very much with some of the things I want to address also today because this kind of engagement with time also led me to work with uh, geology and radiogenic phenomena and also their socio-political implications in the here and now. Uh, I got specifically interested in this dichotomy between human time perception and the time in biological, in, in environmental and geological processes which we as humans are part of. And for me this dichotomy arises, for example, from the present as we as individuals are challenged to engage in endeavors and in measures to secure a human future which we will not be part of, but it is for people which we will also never know. Uh, here actually on the back uh, is an image about an expedition I organized uh, last fall and it's actually looking for traces, as we heard about traces today, this is looking for traces of the first animals uh, they were on the planet. Uh, actually this was in Finland and the rock formation is about 500 million years old. So human impact and the awareness of it are leaving, are leaving human time scales and are entering planetary time, we can say. And this becomes evident with scale effects uh, like the climate breakdown, uh, nuclear waste or other evidence of humans altering the, the Earth system itself uh, as it is discussed in length in the Anthropocene discourse. And my question related to this today is what kind of artistic strategies can assist us to perform the Anthropocene. And during the next half hour, I want to discuss some of the thoughts and also show artworks of myself and other artworks, which in my opinion, share aspects of what I call radical witnessing, uh, which are artistic strategies, which invite us to explore scales which go beyond the human comfort zone. The slide here shows the work Long Player by artist Cem Feiner. And Long Player is a 1,000 year long musical composition. And it began playing midnight uh, uh, on the 31st of December 1999 and will continue to play without repetition until the last moment of 2,999, at which point it will uh, be completed, uh, the cycle, and it will begin again. And Long Player grew out of a conceptual concern with problems of representing and understanding the fluidity and expansiveness of time. While it found its form as a musical composition, it can also be understood as a living 1,000 year old uh, uh, process and social sculpture. Let's first establish a base, baseline on how I think uh, about the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene, as you know, is a proposal for a new geologic uh, epoch because of the realization that human impact is now uh, uh, able to ch change the Earth system itself. It is not yet clear if the term is um, scientifically useful and when in time and where in the strata the Anthropocene should be anchored to fulfill the scientific purpose. Um, but the term finds very strong resonance among artists and humanities scholars and quickly turned into a rebel of contemporary discourse. On the one hand, it is very evocative uh, the, as a concept and welcomed for summarizing this moment of, of crisis. Uh, but on the other hand, also under strong critique and scrutiny for its unsatisfying generalization and anthropocentrism and the production of blind spots, like the obliteration of the responsibility of a few over the many as if each and every human would have the same impact in the symptom production of the Anthropocene. And this is, for example, very well demonstrated 
in the text A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None by Katrin Yusuf, in which he examines how the grammar of geology is foundational to establishing the extractive economies and uh, the following colonization and slavery. On this slide, uh, we see a still from Lauren Cronemeyer's work, Becoming an Epoch Warrior. And while Lauren is definitely a prepper and rehearsing the uh, post-apocalypse in her spare time, the work itself actually is about fighting uh, against the Anthropocene term for the above reason, or at least questioning it. So these shortcomings have led to an interesting deconstruction of the term in the form of anthropomenes. And uh, anthropomenes are various synonyms uh, which are emerging to emphasize different aspects and readings of the Anthropocene. Uh, because, as I said, it's an unsatisfying generalization. And since January 2015, I have become a collector of those anthropomenes. And uh, some of them are quite serious, some of them are playful rewordings, some of them are from renowned scholars, and others are uh, kind of um, just made up on the, on the spot. Um, yeah, to pinpoint or highlight a certain kind of uh, personal aspect. But uh, some are caricatures, but all come with the intention to deconstruct and to repoliticize this term. And I'm sure you know some of them. Uh, so I counted at the moment 88, and I would be happy if you know some or if you come up with some and if you would share them with me. Yeah, and according to Timothy Clark, the Anthropocene itself is a scale effect. That is, at a certain indeterminate threshold, numerous human actions, insignificant in themselves, come together to form a new imponderable physical event, altering the basic ecological cycles of the planet. And let's remember that when we later arrive at the politic of scale. Uh, two other concepts which I frequently use and which actually came up already today are deep time and deep future. And deep time essentially means geological time, uh, Earth history from its beginning uh, until yet, and deep futures, they do not exist yet. They are a thought vehicle to speculate within the possibility space of a future Earth, unfolding during the time our planet has still ahead. What we see on the slide is the artwork Campo de Cielo, uh, Field of Sky, by Katie Patterson. Uh, and she was working with this meteorite which traveled through space and time for four and a half billion years. And it was then cast, it was melted, and then recast back into a new version of itself and replicating itself, and then later returned to space by the European Space Agency. My, my own current artistic research takes place under the umbrella of spectral landscapes. And here I'm investigating radioactivity and the landscape. And during the last two years, I conducted intense field work in Finland, exploring sites of uh, heightened natural radioactivity, some of them also with kind of potential future mining sites. And the radioactivity here is originating from the decay of uranium and thorium, which is in the rock. Here I collect data, which then allow me to portray these gamma radiation fields in the landscape, which protrude from the base rock as complex but inherent features of the landscape itself. And these three-dimensional fields, they extend up to 100 meters from the floor to the sky. And they are invisible but present. And here we see an example of a site. Uh, the, the area is 400 meters long and 200 meters high. And the image in the middle was made with a drone out of 1,600 single images. And this is how it looked in an uh, exhibition then. And 
I refer to these bodies as spectral because their presence is ghostly and can only be detected by extrasensorial means. But then they are also spectral because they actually are fields of light, of photons, just part of the spectrum which is not visible to the human eye. So deep time, deep futures, innate and human-made landscapes, they all kind of find a place in this, uh, in this research project. And then last autumn, I was also able to stay for one, one month at CERN in Switzerland, where I was able to further uh, develop the work. But my interest in the nuclear contemporary actually stems from the fact that Finland, where I live since many, many years, is the first nuclear nation which decided to build a permanent nuclear waste storage facility. It is said to be engineered uh, to keep the waste encapsulated for the next 100,000 years. These are kind of scales we as humans have never worked with, at least not then on an engineering uh, level. And it's kind of completely speculative. So Finland also made the decision that the information about this place, Onkalo, needs to be maintained over time, but it did not specify how to do this. And there is also an excellent film by Michael Madsen, which is called Into Eternity, if you want to know more about that. So it is basically totally unclear what will happen during this 100,000 years on the surface. Multiple ice ages, the next actually in 30,000 years, will be coming and going and will erase all memories from the surface and looking back into human history and the current state of affairs, it is difficult also to imagine that a continuous civilization will be aware of what kind of load was sent into the deep future. And then of course the ice will also shave away the surface and the waste will come always closer to the surface. On this slide you can see the work Crystal Palace, the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nuclear nations, lit up by a combination of uranium glass and uh, UV light by artists Ken and Julia Yonetani. And for me, it is a hauntingly beautiful work which perfectly kind of captures this eerie nuclear desire. But as I said in the beginning, Nuclear contemporary is only one example of those kind of scale effects uh, we are facing and which artists are engaging in. And in general, I think that we can see an increasing amount of artists which are working with complex ecological issues. The climate breakdown is another story, or social and ro uh, racial injustice as a result of past and present practices of colonialism linked with politics of extract, extraction. And coming with it is a growing interest in matters of knowledge and the examination of the real. And I think what is important here is that it is not about the arts defending a postulated truth, uh, but to explore the depths of reality. And by depth, I mean also to go beyond that which we can experience or comprehend within our own bodies, sensorial capabilities. On this slide, we can see a work by artist uh, Martin House, the sketch for an Earth computer. And he asks uh, a very simple question. Where does the execution of software takes, take place? Like, for example, we saw with the, with the phones, but when we, when we uh, open a website, where is the software executed? And for him, in his work, he explores that it is basically not only located in this kind of banal event on the phone itself, but these sites of executions are removed from us in space and in time. It's also the place where these materials are mined to make the mobile phones, but also the history of the fossils which are fueling the cooling systems of the data center which serve to the, to the, uh, to the mobile phone. Benjamin Bratton calls this the scope of the real. And the scope of the real is something which extends beyond the human sensorial and neural comfort zone. Its scales are inhuman and enter the realm of the non-human, in space and in time. 
and it is addressing phenomena which might be too small, too vast, too quick, too slow, and as we heard before by Orkan Telhan, all at the same time. And while we might still be able to put such phenomena into numbers or do calculations on them, it is difficult to find forms of representation. Also, shifting scales not only change quantities, but also lead to a shift in qualities. A complete spectrum of scales is presented in the artwork by Arthur Gensen, which is called Machine in Concrete, a really remarkable work. Each gear pair of the machine, which you can see, reduces the speed of a motor, which is turning um, in a speed of 200 revolutions per minute by 1 50th. And it will take well over 2 trillion years before the final gear makes but one turn. And given the truth of this situation, it is not possible to do anything with the final gear. And you can, like the artist did, even embed it in concrete. Geologist Marcia Björnerud introduces the concept of timefulness to point out that we should adapt to a polytemporal worldview to help us to develop a planetary thinking. Because to understand and act in the world on human scale might appear uh, as a common sense at first, but we need to develop an awareness that the scales we use are not given by the world, but have been with us out of tradition. The last two slides showed details of inheritance, a work, a work I did together with Finnish jewelry artist uh, Mariketto. And inheritance consists of a precious set of jewelry, a necklace, earrings, and a brooch, which are radioactive and therefore rendered practically unbearable. So the basic principles of our ethics, aesthetics, and epistemology were formulated at a time where the human sensorium was believed to be made to the measure of the world. If these principles are not a priori, given by the world, but man-made, then they are actually in the domain of the political. And the politics of scales was a term which was coined by Neil Smith uh, to attend to the processes through which scales are constructed and contested. And Smith notes that geographical scale is political precisely because, because it is the technology according to which events and people are um, quite literally contained in space. Alternatively, scale demarcates the space or spaces people take up or make for themselves. In scale, therefore, are distilled the oppressive and emancipatory possibility of space, its deadness, but also its life. So while Smith is examining geographical space, we can see what we heard from Pretten and Pjörnerud, that a more general evaluation of scales is of interest, an undertaking which I think we can very well locate in contemporary artistic practices, and specifically in what uh, Turpin calls the geologic turn. On this slide, we see a work by Doris Salcedo, and she installed a crack in the earth of Tate's Turbin Hall to address a long legacy of racism and colonialism that underlies the modern world, almost as a principle of nature, pinpointing the enabling cause for what we now call the planetary crisis. We might be able to continue from Neil Smith when we expand the politics of scales from the geographical space with time. We could introduce a geo-temporal scale and say that it is polit political precisely because analog to geographical scale, it demarcates the space over time which future humans or other entities are able to take up or make space for themselves. It is now that we draw the temporalities which future generations have for them or have to deal with. 
This probably not only counts for toxicities, but as well for resources, which once extracted from an enriched environment are now becoming dispersed and diluted and rendered lost until future geological processes might enrich them again, while some, like coal, are unlikely to be reproduced again in the abundance it is available to us at this moment. Others, like forests, the oceans, the soil or air, have the potential to renew themselves. The work we see on the background is called Rare Earthenware uh, by a group called Unknown Fields Division. And it deals with the geological dimensions, uh, with the ecological dimensions and scales of uh, waste in rare earth element production, the material we need for our technology. Here with an artisan sophistication, the artists made three exact kind of uh, Ming style vases from the exact amount of the toxic waste used to produce three objects of technology, the smartphone, the laptop, and the electric car battery cell. And the slightly radioactive and toxic vases offer a dark irony between the cultural heritage and the hidden heritage of the toxic waste, which will make the land useless over many generations. The Yuta Tarim connection, which we see here on the slide, is a work by a Dutch uh, artist, Gerrit van Bakel, and it links two uh, huge level stretches of the world's surface. On the one hand, the salt flats of the Yuta in America, which was used to kind of make these rocket car high speed uh, tests and records. And then, on the other hand, the immense landmass of the Tarim Plain in Asia to the north of Tibet. And while the Yuta wheel, which we see here on the left uh, lower corner, uh, takes on these kind of high-speed monsters, like the Blue Flame, I think was one of them, with its own whimsical speed of 18 millimeter per day, the machine for the Tarim Basin crawls at about the same speed across this stretch of 1,100 kilometers. And it will, according to the artist's calculations, take about 30 million years to cross it. And I think of this machine becoming part of this environment, of this landscape, part of its time, people coming, people going, being assisted, being maintained over deep futures, being witness, but also bearing witness itself. A couple of years ago, when discussing keywords for a publication text uh, for my work, Polsprung, with curator Armin Medos, who unfortunately left us already, the term radical witnessing came up as a descriptive term for the installation with radical in its meaning of going to the roots, of being fundamental. Because part of Polsprung is an observatory to witness a polar reversal, which um, happens probably every 800,000 years, where North and South Pole swap places. And most estimates for the duration of such a reversal uh, between 1,000 and 10,000 years. So the German word Sprung means jump. And such a reversal is a jump in, in deep geological time, but in relation to human life, it's basically nearly motionless. So the radical element in the work is to let the reversal act out in its own time instead of translating the polar transition into the time frame of the visitor, which would be a downscaling of the reversal into the human sensorial comfort zone. So the collection of evidence by this observatory as the process of the reversal itself outlives any singular witness, every visitor. One might even say the work itself is becoming the witness, answering to whomever is asking for evidence. 
And I think that many of the works I showed today and many more I was not able to discuss show elements of what I would like to summarize under this idea of radical witnessing. What these artists and their works have in common is that they stage attempts uh, for a thing, a machine, a process or a question to articulate itself through an intrinsic feature of itself, through its own language, if you wish. Like here, the Iron Ring project by artist Cecilia Jonsson, which is a poetic and material-based journey about mining and pollution, which connects 23 kilogram of iron-rich plants, which he collected actually in a Spanish uh, iron mine, together with the connected together with the, with the ring of three gram of iron forged out of the iron, harvested then from the plants themselves. So with radical witnessing, the artworks perform the evidence through their own materiality, through their own temporal properties and processes they enact. And they do this to whomever is asking for evidence and is attuned to the scale. I think that we can find in those strategies less representation or translation, but more of a direct encounter with the scope of the real to come back to Benjamin Breton. As we as humans engulf ourselves intentionally or unintentionally into processes which outlive us as individuals, we could as well equip ourselves with the necessary tools and languages to understand them. Thanks.